Hey, what's up, everybody? It's me, your hero, Benjamin Banks from the Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks podcast. And I got my co-host, Rebellious D and Trav, with me. What's good tonight, fellas? It's the same old, bro. You know. Y'all not going to say anything? Just I peace? Just, I said it all. Uh, well, I like for y'all to go first and start tearing each other apart. Always wait Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Rebellious D. Jesus Christ. It's like y'all got to introduce yourself to the people that are watching this video on YouTube. Bro, he's supposed to be PG, and you throwing JC around. And I ain't talking about in sync. Uh, you mean John Cena? I'm talking about John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> so on tonight's episode, we have joining them with us, Lum from the Manga Maverick Podcast and the Lum Squad Podcast. And I met this person on the My Hair Academia Podcast. So Lum, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be here, and congrats to you guys for, again, two-year anniversary and over 100 episodes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. We appreciate that. Hey, I got a question for y'all, though. Yeah. What's that? Did y'all see Lum's Garage? No. Oh. Well, you need to. Why? <laughs> yeah, right, where are you going with this, Trav? Yeah, where are you going with it? Huh? Huh? They Where are you going picture. with this? Mm -hmm. I said they posted a picture of their uh, not garage. I'm what's it's it's basically in my basement, basement my basement. former basement. All right, well, I mean, Travis, like you got to give us more. Yeah, you know, man, you got to <laughs> give us some of that, man. That was you was like, do we see love love garage? So, <laughs> yesterday I was at my old house to do some cleanup, and part of that cleanup is taking down all my old anime posters that I put up around my basement. And there are a lot of them. They're strewn all about the walls. And <laughs> it's quite a collection I had amassed and put up on the walls over the years. Nice, Pretty nice, sweet. nice. And well, talk I'm going to I'm gonna have to head over to Twitter land and see these pictures and these posters and everything. Because we all love anime here. And yeah. uh, just before uh, we get into talking about today's topic, Promise Neverland everybody that is watching this video on youtube make sure that you like and subscribe so that way you can keep up with the fellas here at the leveling up with benjamin banks podcast so um before we start talking about promise neverland tell our listeners a little bit about yourself you know tell everybody about your podcast that you host and everything like that let the world know who you are yeah hi i'm Lum again and I host, the, as mentioned, the Manga Matters Podcast. We're a podcast dedicated to discussing manga as a medium and an industry. So we recap the latest news going on, licensing news, industry news, publication news, what series are starting and ending, all that. We also review series on the show, doing big retrospectives on classics like Dragon Ball and Saint Seiya, Yu-Gi-Oh!, and of course, we induct, uh, conduct interviews with a lot of people who are working in the industry. Jason Thompson, the original editor of the North American Shonen Dump. David oh. Brothers, editor of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Woo! And Caleb Cook, translator of My Hero Academia, among many other wonderful guests we've been honored to have on our show over the years. And we're coming up on our fifth anniversary too. So it's been quite a rewarding journey. Pretty That's sweet. awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a hell of a resume. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah, we're happy to have you up here with us as a guest today. So thank you again, Trav. Thank you for sliding in the DMs. It was it was crazy because Lum, yeah, I didn't know y'all knew each other. Yeah, Lum, I believe like you had either liked or retweeted something on our Twitter. Yeah, and your interview with Bo Billingsley, which was fantastic, by the way. I mean, what an amazing you. life he's lived. Yeah, I know, like, like it was like a life story. It's yeah, like yeah. I felt like I was <laughs> learning something. It, it it came off. It was a uh, it was four different generations. Well, two different generations because we're all around the same age, except you know Bo's older than us. But yeah, like it was it was cool just getting different perspectives from different lives over stuff. And I was honored to have him up here as a guest, and I hope to bring him back on in the future. I'd love to hear it. Thank mm. you, thank you. So Trav. He had slid in your DMs and <laughs> he was like, like he was just like, yeah, 
I want to bring them on to the podcast. And I was just like, yeah, I know who they are. And he was just like, well, how do you know them? And I was just like, well, we did the My Hair Academia podcast together. It's just like, who doesn't know Benjamin Banks? I know everybody. Like, I, <laughs> I get I get asked this question all the time on Facebook. Like, if I comment on somebody's picture or if I share something, they're just like, well, how do you know this person? And I'm like, I'm Benjamin Banks. I know everybody. The social media whore that you are. <laughs> hey, 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 watch your talk. How are you going to say that we're PG? And then you just drop the W word. Like, chill, bro. There's no such thing as the W word. Bro. There is. You just said it. Nah, you just said it. I said you... it already. Okay. All right. Well, with that being said, thank you, Lum, for telling us your origin story and telling everybody who you are. So let's go ahead and get into today's episode, Promise Neverland. So Promise Neverland, the manga debuted August 1st, 2016, and it ended last year, June 15th. It had 20 volumes, and then the anime, which started last year in January, on January 11th, 2019, a couple of weeks before my birthday, um, I didn't watch the anime when it initially dropped. I remember uh, I'm in this group on Facebook called Urban Anime Lounge, and they somebody had posted pictures from the manga in the Facebook group, and the character that they were talking about was Sister Crone. And when I saw how she was drawn, like she kind of looked like it, it kind of looked offensive when I saw how she was drawn. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not I'm not checking this out. And like, that's how a lot of the black members of the group were. They were just like, well, why is she drawn like this? Because everybody just felt that with how far we've come as a society, um, when you look at most manga and most animes, it's like the way that African-Americans are drawn in those, they're they look like us you know what i'm saying it's like they don't look like characters that were drawn in the 80s like if you were to uh read or watch the original dragon ball like mm -hmm. those characters like they have like really huge lip like they look like african caricatures so when we all saw sister crone we were just like okay yeah we're passing on this but people were in the group saying like y'all should still check it out it's a good series and everything and you know, one thing led to another, and one day last year, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to give this anime a chance because I saw a trailer for it. You know how Netflix plays the trailers whenever you finish watching a movie or something. And I watched the first episode, and I was hooked. I was just like, wow, like this thing is incredible. So uh, starting with you, Lum, how were you introduced to this anime or the manga? Which one did you come across first? I started with the manga from the very first chapter. I was subscribed to Shonen Jump, so when Promise Era started up, like I read the first chapter, hooked from the first chapter, it was such a great confidence and so unique for Jump to have just this psychological thriller kind of story at as it was at the start. And yeah, I just had followed it from very beginning of the manga to the very end last year. So it was quite a ride or the four years it was running yeah. and yeah i mean you could probably revisit my initial thoughts on it on the mon rivers episode where he covered the first chapter way back those many years ago but yeah it's a really fun ride and of course i watched the anime when it came out too and when the dub was on tanami and i enjoyed that and i enjoyed rewatching it and prep for this podcast too like man that that anime adaptation is just so well made i was impressed yeah. all over again yeah, I completely agree with you. And uh, before I move to you, Trav, to ask you a question, I want to ask you this, Lum. You mentioned that it's been around for four years. It wrapped up pretty quick. How do you feel about series that have short endings? You know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're not ongoing series. You know, it's kind of like Demon Slayer, for example. Demon Slayer mm -hmm. ended last year, I believe. Like, do you think that, uh, like, series, do you think that they should go on as long as you know overrated animes like one piece or <laughs> um do you think that they should wrap up hold on d let them ask let them ask the question, let them ask the question. <laughs> well i am always happy when an artist and writer are able to tell their story the way they want to whatever length that turns out to be and I feel that was the case with The Promise Neverland. I do think there are parts in the story where it seemed like there were things the writer wanted to include that because of pacing time reasons they might have not been able to, which 
is where I think some of the bonus chapters that have come out since the manga ended have been ways for them to kind of add some of that stuff that they originally want to do back in. And I've heard that, you know, Kai Shirai, the writer, is working on the strips for this new season of the anime. So maybe they're going to also going to try and integrate some ideas that they had left on the cutting room floor into the new season. But overall, I think that they told the story they wanted to tell and the time that they wanted to tell it. And I think that's satisfying. I don't think it's a good idea to extend the story past the expiration date or past what the author had envisioned unless they had an idea to continue it. If they've come to an appropriate stopping point, the place they want to end it, I think it's best to let them end it. Nice, nice, nice answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. Trav, moving to you. How were you introduced to it? Uh, yeah. I mean, once an anime, once a manga gets an anime adaption and it blows up, pretty much when you're in that anime circle, dude, like, you're gonna hear about it, regardless of if you want to check it out or not. You know, guys like me and D constantly have to get bombarded with JoJo stuff, even though, uh... <laughs> We don't like it, and that's a shot because uh, you said you weren't going to take a shot at One Piece, and you did. So I mean, well, you took a shot at JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. That, that was before we were on the air, sir. I mean, but you started before. it. I mean, you started hey, it. I finished it. And I it. just finished it, baby. Oh, no. What up? No, no, no. So, yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, just the... I don't know how the manga animation st style is versus the anime. But, uh, dude, the drawing style of it, like, that's what drew me into Death Note originally, was just seeing how it was depicted. And I was like, yeah, I gotta check that out. And it was the same thing for Promised Another Neverland. Like, I seen it, and I was like, yeah, this looks fire. And yeah. like you, I saw that first episode and binged it. Yes. Now, let me ask you something real quick, because you said that you're a fan of the drawing style. The same studio that did Promise Neverland, they also did Fairy Tale, and I know that you're a huge Fairy Tale fan. So, would you say that that was the reason why you were drawn to the anime drawn style? Well, they did the last season of Fairy Tale. They didn't do all of Fairy Tale, so oh. I'm not I'm not that far in Fairy Tale, so I'm not sure where it goes. But they did do the Persona Five anime, which yeah. uh, is fabulous. I need to check that out. Well. So yeah, you'd need to check it out since you're playing the game now. Yep. And uh highly recommend the anime too, bro. Thank you, thank you. All right, D, round us out. Let them know. Let them know, D. So I was introduced to it by a uh, a good uh lifelong friend named uh Benjamin Banks. He oh, put me on you. Yeah, yeah, man, he put me on to it and uh I just jumped on it and just it, it reminds me a lot of uh, creature feature horror movies, so it's very easy to watch to me. And it's uh, very suspenseful and um, cat and mouse, literally. Very easy to get into. Very easy. So, mm -hmm. I agree with you on it. I, you know, I appreciate you taking my advice and checking it out. Like, And also, just to let you know, I just started watching the anime that you have recommended to me. Uh, it's Violet. At Violet. Garden. Violet, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm on. I'm yep. on the Fire. second. I'm on the second episode right now. Um, I because you know most of the time when an episode ends on Netflix, um, there aren't any credits. I mean, like the credits play, it just goes straight to the next episode. Whereas with mm -hmm. this, it's like the ep like it feels like there are no credits at all. Like the mm -hmm. the show just keeps on going, and I'm just like, well, mm -hmm. when is it gonna wrap up? So yeah, I'm two episodes in right now. So I just want to say thanks, everybody, for, you know, saying how y'all found out about the anime and any, everything like that. Trav, did you have any other questions that you wanted to ask before we moved on? No, I'm good, bro. Oh. About, uh, you know, origin stories. Oh, and... oh okay. Fuck. <laughs> I, redo it. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> So uh, just just start after <laughs> when I ask. Do you have any other questions? No, you ask again. No, because I I don't have to ask. No, no, like, you I... ask again. Oh God, just go ahead and ask the question. God damn it. What am I asking? You see, Lum, you see what I have to go with. <laughs> you see what I have to go. With? <laughs> yeah. 
So, Lum, no, I was wondering how you came up with your, uh, your, I guess it's your social media, uh, tag? What do they call that? And you handle. Handle. Yeah, handle. Yeah, handle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my handle comes from the protagonist names of Street of Yurumiko Takahashi's major series, Yurisiyatsu, Ron Mahath, and Inuyasha. I'm a huge fan of Rumiko Takashi's works, and so when the time came for me to create a Twitter account and think of a handle, I was like, hey, I'll just combine the names of these characters I love from these series I love. Yeah, see, now I didn't watch Ranma or, you know, read the manga, but I do know what it is. I never watched any of the Lum stuff, but I was a huge fan of Inuyasha. Like, we all watched it in middle school back in the day. And now you have the sequel series, Yashahimi, which just came out last year. I want to say it was October last year that it came yeah. out. And for the most part, I think that it's it's okay. Um, I think that the intro and the outro song, I think that they're both fired. Yeah. I love the new characters. I just feel like that the show is kind of missing something. I don't know what it is, but I feel like once it finds what it needs, I think that the series will be good. How do you feel about it? Have you watched it? Yeah, I've watched it, and I would agree with you. I really like the characters, particularly Moroha. I think she's a lot of fun. And, you know, I am a big fan of the Shomaru, so when I found out the show was going to be about his kids in particular, I was like, yeah, that's cool. And I like that, you know, it's an all-female trio, too, which is rare for, like, a shonen action show. But I will agree with you. I feel like the plot is a little meandering. The characters don't feel like they have much of a drive to go on their quests and adventures. They work their way through like the generals of the big bad, kind of through the happenstance of encountering them, not really through like coordinated effort. Like, yeah, we gotta take these guys on. They just happen to be like, hey, you know, we're hunting bounties for demons. Uh, I guess we've run into this guy. I guess we'll take them out now so you know they're not really interested in any deeper mysteries of like what happened to their parents or what happened in their past they want to get back uh, sets in his memories but they aren't really working very aggressively towards that they're just very lax about everything so it's it yeah. feels like the show just doesn't have much drive to it and i think that's what's disappointing yeah well it's better than borto and we know this Mm, well, I don't know. I feel like Boruto, as particularly the manga as it is now, has better uh, drive in terms of like character motivations, and I think that it's done some interesting things with character arcs, uh, particularly with Kawaki, who is a character they introduced, you know, who is a new character. I think exactly. he's been interesting. I think the Kawaki naruto relationship like mentor student relationship i think that's been pretty compelling so i don't know i think boruto manga wise is shaping up pretty interesting i think the anime has the problem like it meanders sometimes because they you know they can't do like the manga kara plot stuff because manga is monthly and then the anime is weekly so they invent their own original stories but you know i think boruto is doing fine i enjoy well, it i'm 90 episodes into it and I ain't impressed yet, so... Yeah. I yeah. watch it because mm. I'm obliged to watch it. <laughs> yeah, right. see, see, Lum, I just finished watching Shippuden last year. Yeah, like not that was really. The start, <laughs> yeah, I skipped, I skipped all the filler. Skipping? I skipped all the filler, like, thank God. No yeah, you know. Thank God I did not have, like, it was yeah. like when I was watching it, I was just like, man, I felt bad for everybody that watched it when it was on TV <laughs> because the filler... Like I did, I did check out some of the filler, and it was horrible. Like I was just like, how could y'all sit through this? So a lot of it is. There are some good filler arcs. Like the power arc is really interesting. It's like a reimagining of the Shinobi War in just a different context, and it's only six episodes. But the direction and animation in it is really stellar and has this somber, dark tone that is really interesting. Like that is like a standout filler arc but like the rest of it is just it interrupts the, the show and the pacing of the show especially like when they get into the stretch when they're just fighting uh obito and madara and that's like a hundred episodes and they're just fighting yeah. them it's like you get in that fight interrupted by like 
Say weeks it. upon weeks of filler arcs. The worst is when the infinite Tsukiyomi happens, and then we have, you know, we get all these like stories of like characters having their dream worlds in the infinite Tsukiyomi for like a couple characters. We get Tenten, Kaden, and I think Killer B, and then we get to Sanadi, and Sanadi's is just her reading Jiraiya's novel, and it's just right. this reimagining of the plot of Naruto, and that's 20 episodes? Yeah, what? I I when remember you, do something, uh, you give it your all. It was exactly. it was one, it was one filler episode that I was watching when they were fighting. I, I, it was either Obito or Madara, and it was Karama just talking about uh, Naruto's growth from the beginning. And I'm just like, I mean, I already know, I've already seen it. Like, I don't need to see his growth again. And then they always show the swing. It's just like I don't, I've right. I, I seen this swing so many times. <laughs> it's like exactly. I don't need to keep seeing the swing. Uh, you need to see so that so many flash. Swing gonna get you. So many flashbacks and stuff that is irrelevant to what's going on right now. But yeah, so let's go ahead and get into Promise Neverland since we got all the introductions and everything out of the way. So the series, it takes place in the year 2045. It's about a group of orphans, 37 of them, that stay at the Grassfield house. And they are being watched over by mother, Isabella. So, oh, what were we about to say, Trev? Mother. Mother, mom, right? <laughs> or should I should I say it like uh, the baby said it in Son of the Mask? Mother. Yes. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So um, yeah, so we have these orphans, and the three main characters are Emma, Norman, and Ray. And Emma, she is the what I say like she's the leader of the group. Um, she loves mother the most, and how. The story starts is Connie, she's getting adopted and she ends up leaving her stuffed animal at the field house. So Norman and Emma, they go to take Connie, her stuffed, I believe it was a stuffed rabbit, stuffed bunny. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so they go to they go to the gate, which they're not allowed to go to. And when they get there, they see that Connie's dead body is inside of a back of a truck. And then we see these grotesque monsters that are demons. And we see that mother is talking to the demons. And one of the demons smells human. And it's just like, I, I smell something real good right now. And <laughs> Emma and Norman, they end up escaping. And Ray is sitting there waiting for them. And uh, that's pretty much how this, the first episode is. And I remember like watching this episode. And I was just like, man, it's like I need to continue watching. It's just like. How we were talking about in our Cobra Kai episode last week. Um, this is something that was, it's just like, I need to binge. And also, too, I forgot as well that um, when this episode drops, it's going to be dropping on my birthday. I forgot about oh, that. Like, how, how, could I, how, how could I forget about this? It's because we're recording tonight. Yes, I forgot. Of, my, of course, how could you forget? You bring it up every damn time we talk. My When, when we do this episode when promise neverland episode comes out it'll be my 32nd birthday so i want to just go ahead and say uh it's gonna be my birthday and i'd appreciate it if all of you say happy birthday to me happy birthday thank you uh, uh, i don't <laughs> think captain luffy will let me do that so Ooh, why no luffy would totally <laughs> celebrate someone's birthday treated like usopp right now you know <laughs> hey long hey long you don't have to become a sniper king uh -huh. hey long i i need to just go ahead and kick them off the ship now this is what i have to deal with this is what i have to deal with I, happy I, I, birthday this dude's been talking about his damn birthday since november yeah, <laughs> because no because you know why you know why because when i looked at the calendar i was just like oh wow an episode is gonna fall on my birthday so yeah this is the birthday episode of leveling up with benjamin banks and it's my podcast and it airs on my birthday so yeah so this is the birthday episode and it's a promised birthday land that's what this episode is gonna be called promised birthday land uh, Why oh, uh just um <laughs> <laughs> the trash. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So, the first episode we're introduced to the demons and whatnot. So, uh, Trav, I know that you said earlier that you got hooked. You binged it after that. Lum, how did you feel when you watched the first episode of this series and you saw that ending? Like, were you hooked after you finished watching it? 
Well, I started with the manga, but that same moment, yes, it was a very good hook in the first chapter of the manga, too. And it's like, okay, wow, like, this is a really dark uh, situation for these kids. And yeah, how are they going to get out with the, you know, mom that has been taking care of them all this time? Who, you know, they thought was a loving caretaker, but instead they've just been found out that, you know, she's just been raising them as cattle. And that's a huge source of betrayal. Yep. Uh, and she's also incredibly cunning and smart. And so they have to, how will they outwit her to get away from this? How will they save their friends, their family? And how are they going to survive in a world full of demons? Like it leaves you at the end of that first chapter and episode with just so many great hooks yep. to see like how these kids are going to escape and survive. D. Oh yeah, man. It's, I thought it was a, a wonderful way to open up. And as Lum said, uh, just the, the, the thought of reading it instead of watching it, I think it's one of those more intriguing things. Like it, that would instantly hook me if I was reading the manga opposed to watching the anime. Um, I thought it was a wonderful first uh, pilot episode and a great way to draw viewers in. There's no way you watch that and you're like, oh, I'm good. You know, there's no way. So, Brad, I said it already. You, you I just want to say if you I just want to see if you want to add anything else on it so I didn't leave you hanging. Hey, you no, know your boy watched it and binged it. Took me. Two days, bro. Knocked days. them all out. Yeah, I, I'll say, yeah, it took me about two days, too, to finish watching the series. Uh, well, not the whole series, but just season one. Um, I got Zoe they, watching it. She's watching it now. Boy, nice. I bet she's terrified, isn't she? Yeah, that's she why I was like the same age as that. I was about she to say, dude. Is, bro. You should see her under the covers. Like, Oh, man. Yeah, that's Those demons, bro. Oh. Like, Zoe, she's nine years old, and I was, I was like, is that is that a suitable anime for her to watch? Oh, of course. Would you let her yeah. watch Death yeah. Note? Of course, she, of course, she's already seen it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you would you let her watch uh, Attack on Titan? Uh, she watched it. And she was like, "Eh." Yeah, that was kind of. I don't really think kids would get into that. Not at that age. Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to yeah, yeah, just watch it. Really it the I'm story thinking, so like, wasn't enough. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, what about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? <laughs> she gave it a hot thumbs down, bro. Hot thumbs down. Oh, like to you know <laughs> she said, "Hey, she said, can you put back on my hero, please?" <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! So now that the kids know what's going on and that they're being uh, harvested as food for the demons now, uh, they they discover that. The smarter that they are, the more tasty that they'll be for the demons. Now, this conversation that I was having with D, where it's like pretty much the kids are looked at as food on a farm, like uh, like chickens, cows, pigs, stuff like that. And they live in a world where the demons are the people. And it's crazy because, you know, on social media, you'll see these ads where it's like you might have some sort of animal in a restaurant or something and it's like they're eating a human or something like that and that's kind of what i get with this series where it's like the demons are the rulers of the world and they are eating the children um do you do y'all think that uh that they eat any of the adults as well or do you think that they just kill the adults i'll start with you lum I think that is implied, uh, just restricting it to the first season, especially with, you know, what happens with Sister Crona. Like, I think the implication is that any humans they kill, they do eat, but children are the tastiest. So they usually kill them off at age 12 once their brain reaches a certain level of maturity and intelligence. D? Yeah, uh, you heard Lum. He he summed it up. I mean, you saw what happened to Sister Sister Krona. Uh, she uh, got taken out, brother. You know, so yeah. they were gonna eat her. Trav, it's it's the same answer. It's like I mean, I just want to know if you're gonna say anything different. It's like it's like look, just say no comment, no comment. Or, or I, I have Marshawn Lynch. You know what I'm saying? I was just, only here so I don't get fined. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, I mean, like when Sister Krona died, it's crazy because it's like when we're introduced to her, she's brought in as an assistant because mother, she needs help because she knows that some of the kids know. Like she already knows that Emma and Norman left the compound and that they have tracking devices inside of them. And she she just wants to see like well, what's going to happen first like are they going to reveal themselves are they going to try to escape or can we keep them here long enough so that way we can give them to the demons so that way that the demons can eat them uh norman is the most intelligent uh kid at the compound and um he gets the highest test scores and whatnot and his biggest rival is ray who eventually we find out that Ray is a traitor. He's did working that catch with, you off guard. It did catch me off guard because it was something that I wasn't expecting. Uh, you know, Emma and Norman, they didn't know which which uh, orphan there was a traitor. They had a feeling, but they wanted to see. And so they eventually invited Don and Gilda into their little faction because it's like they assumed that something was going on. When I first saw Gilda, I thought that Gilda was going to be the one that was going to be the traitor. And when we saw that Ray was the traitor, I was shocked. And that's one of the things that I love about this series. I always love when a series can shock you or something and catch you off guard. D, how did you feel when it was revealed that Ray was the traitor to the group? Uh, I I had my suspicions kind of because of he was too way too laid back about everything, and uh, Don my man Don was obviously innocent because he was pretty just you know he he just seemed like a brute almost in a way like the the powerhouse guy lower intelligence and then Gilda it would have had to been Ray or Gilda it had to be one of the two. Uh, just on about that. I, I just I just also noticed too that we're all wearing glasses too. I just noticed that. <laughs> glasses gang. Yeah, glasses gang in the house. Hey. Yeah. I, I'm I'm a level with you, bro. I already knew. And Norman knew. Mm. Which is mm. why he planted the traps for everybody. He was like, I'm 99% sure it's Ray, but yeah. just in case, this is how I'm gonna catch him. Mm -hmm. I've seen way too many yeah way right too many different shows i knew that it was gonna be yeah i was like dude it has to be either he was way too relaxed but about let me everything tell you <laughs> zoe's face when she found out it was right the, <laughs> the, the, the look of betrayal on mm -hmm. <laughs> i honestly enjoy watching her reactions more than the show to me oh i bet i bet That's like just like how she reacted when pikachu spoke his first words <laughs> <laughs> What is it? Then you then you say she was like, "Holy she cow!" Said, Holy cow. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> she was blown away. Oh yeah. Yo, I, I, I think we all were because I remember when somebody somebody had posted a video online, and when Pikachu started talking, I was just like, "Are you for real?" Like <laughs> Pikachu can talk, and that's probably my favorite Pokemon movie. It was all right, dude. It was so good. Such a right. retelling. Oh my god. Yeah. I thought it was a really nice retelling, yeah. Oh, I appreciated that it was also like intergenerational. Like they took care to have characters uh at Pokemon from like, you know, fourth generation, seventh generation. Like they had it like um stuff that was current, stuff that was ten yeah, years ago, stuff that was twenty years ago. So yeah. I thought that was really clever. <clears throat> uh Lum, same question for you. How did you feel when Ray was revealed as the traitor with the faction. Yeah, I thought that was a really great reveal. I think one of my favorite things in rewatching Promise Everland is just paying attention to Ray as a character because they do signal the twist pretty, yeah. you know, heavily. But you know, it's if you're watching it through first time, reading it through first time, you're maybe not picking up on it. But like, just you know, paying attention to when Ray is coming in, how he's reacting to Emma and Norman discussing plans and then when he is voicing his own input in opposition to their plans and dropping bits of information to them just all the way up until the reveal of like that he's known all along and he's been working for mom for the past couple of years like it's really well done I think Ray is one of the most interesting and compelling characters in this season of the Promised Everland for sure yeah, it was very M. Night-ish. 
Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, I, I go back to, you know, what D was saying earlier about how it's a game of cat and mouse. And that's something that we saw throughout the entire thing. Like that scene where I'm, you know, it's one of the scenes that everybody saw online, just the image still of mom hunched over looking down at Emma and like how creepy it looked. And mm -hmm. it's like, I laugh because we see the same image for the live action movie. <laughs> and, and, and you was hating? And mom, it, it's like, Emma is a grown woman in this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's oh, like, no. It's like hey. mom is, mom's looking up at her. I'm just <laughs> like, it doesn't even look intimidating or scary at <laughs> all. Yo, look, yeah. normally, normally you don't trash stuff, right? But you was trashing it, and they was coming at you for trashing it. No. Mm. They weren't coming at me. They were only coming at me at the fact that because they couldn't get uh, a black actress to play Sister Crona, which... No, they, they, they were coming at you for you talking about the size of the woman. Yeah. Oh, I, nobody came at me for that. Everybody was laughing. Oh, hell what? no. I saw I saw some people upset with you, bro. I think they, it, they, it, it was probably just see. it was probably just one person that was just like, well, it's just a movie. It's not that serious. But it's just like, these are, they're supposed to be kids. They're kids. Yeah. yeah. Not... Like, part of the danger, part of what makes the series so intense is that the ki these are kids they're extremely vulnerable they're competing against adults and demons you lose a little of that when they are also clearly you know older teenagers slash young adults as in this case of this new live action movie yeah. like it you just feel like they're a little less vulnerable and they're a little more capable in a way that robs some of the intensity and direness in the situation yeah it's, it's i agree it's also crazy that uh, the actress that plays Emma, she's 25 years old playing a 17 year old, and I'm just like, uh, hold, on, hold on, they they even bumped up their age in the live action, like on at, purpose. They're seven, well, yeah, because the the actors and actresses that that portray them are older. I I can't remember the reason why they said that they bumped up the age. I I think that they said that uh they wanted to get a better feel. For having like adults play it, it was some dumb reason look mm -hmm. i'm gonna watch the movie. yeah oh, i'm gonna watch the movie, but it's like i don't oh, think course. that it's gonna be a good movie at it all it can't be yeah. any worse than bleach so <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds to me like they didn't trust child actors to be able to play no. the, these parts which they should have think they, they should trust their adult actors <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's just crazy. But, you know, like I was just saying about like the whole game of cat and mouse where it's like now that the kids know that um, that they're being harvested and whatnot, it's like it's up to Emma and Norman to show and help the other kids. So that way that they can all try to escape this farm um, so that way that they can live and they end up finding out that they do have some help from the outside by a gentleman named Mr. Minerva, who it's like when he leaves books, where he drops off books to the farm, it's like there's uh, decoded messages in these books. And like, that's how they escape the farm. Now, Mr. Minerva, he is somebody, he kind of reminds me of Racer X, who is just there to help. I can't wait until um, we finally see what he looks like. I, Lum, I know that you know, because you read the manga, but um, I think with this, I'm just gonna stick with the anime. And uh, if I do get bored, I mean, it's not like My Hero Academia where it was like I was having My Hero Academia withdrawals and I needed to, <laughs> I needed to, cause Trav can tell you, like there was a point in time where it's like all I was posting on Facebook was My Hero Academia stuff, <laughs> like every day. It um, sad. It wasn't sad, cause I love, yeah. I no, love My Hero. My is awesome. Thank you, thank you. Um, this was an addiction. This was this became I, a problem. Like, I was yeah, I was addicted. I, it's like I, I've I've calmed down now, but uh, it's like yeah, like when I started reading the manga, it was right at the the um, overhaul arc. So I was hyped. I was hyped for it. But um, so like I just wanted to ask, how did you guys feel about? the whole overall like cat and mouse feel to you know now norman and emma having to train all of these kids like if 
Trav, starting with you, if you were in that position, do you think that you would be able and capable to train 36 other children to escape this farm? Honestly, I don't think it matters if you're capable or not. These are your brothers and sisters. That's this is all you know. This is family. So you got no choice, you know, but yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you think That's that they would listen to you? Would you would you be on some Mandalorian type uh, stuff like this is the way, and they are baby Yodas? That's right, that's the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lam, how about you? <clears throat> Man, I don't know if I'm capable, but I agree with Trav. They're family. You got to do your best to help them survive and escape the situation. So just like Emma and Norman, I would also try my best to help them. And yeah, it is an interesting game you have to play of like how much you let them know and when to tell them the truth, which is an early point of conflict in the series is that they don't tell Don and Gilda the truth. They lie to him and say, oh, Connie was taken away by bad people and she still might be alive in there. They don't tell her, tell them about demons and that she's already dead. And then when they find out like Don is livid, he he punches yeah. Norman and Ray straight in the face. And you know, it's just feeling really betrayed that they wouldn't trust them with that information. But from that experience, you know, Emma realized, hey, you know, our family, like we, they are more stronger than we think they are braver than we think we got to tell them the truth and she does do that with the rest of the kids from there on out so you know i think it's a tough situation to be in especially you know because they're looking out for the younger members of their family but i think it's a good message about putting trust in other people and that they and believing in them to be capable and brave and you know able to accomplish this you know what seems like a arduous daunting task together through collective effort it can be accomplished D? yeah hey guys I, i'm just letting y'all know right now i probably would have went more of a children of the corn uh approach <laughs> to this i would have probably went straight up there hey uh you with me don he's clearly the strongest one there he's with me that's the muscle and uh hey i'm just saying uh i ought to try to take her out i'm just saying i mean it is family i'm not gonna say i'd be able to outwit her and all that norman stuff but i'll wait for her in the hallway you know so you would be right. down to, yeah down hey yeah no hey mother i need you soapy water in the floor you know it's like 15 <laughs> kids jump on you what you gonna do and then, I mean, you know <laughs> Now, see, now that's something that we really didn't get to see a lot of in season one was mother's abilities. Now, we did get to see what she could do in flashbacks, which right. is something that I love that they did for her and Sister Prona. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you know, oh. it, it was before before I w talk about mother, but like when they showed Sister Prona's upbringing and oh, I want to talk about it. Dude. And yeah, showed, I want to it, talk about it. It showed her it showed her backstory and how it was like you know it was her goal to become a mother um and then she thought that she was doing everything right but then grandma and and isabella they were in on it the whole time they knew that sister crona was you know betraying them and whatnot and they later have her killed how did y'all feel when we see her backstory we see her upbringing and then she gets killed starting with you d how did you feel like did you feel bad for her when she got killed or do you think that it was um, hurt? Yeah, well, with Sister Krona, I think it's very interesting. Now, to become a sister or start that process, you have to be a mother, correct? No. Yeah, you have to give. No, you have to give birth. You have to give birth. It, yeah. Okay, so now, how old is Sister Krona, gentlemen? I in think she's story? in her 20s. Yeah, she ha now, she's that, in her 20s. She's a little younger than Isabella, who is in her early 30s. Yes. Okay, so do you think it's a possibility that we will see a, her child down the no, line? No, don't ask. Store? Don't ask that because Lum knows. <laughs> oh. Uh, I'm about season one. <laughs> I mean, well, it's he can still question, play though. along. It's, it's, yeah, it's still a good question. About. Yeah, exactly. Do you think we'll see her child later in the line, or you think they'll join the ranks? 
uh, it's a, it's a possibility because mm-hmm. I mean we eventually find out that Ray is Isabella's son, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, I, that was a huge shocker when that yeah, it was because that Ray. Was when Ray was singing the song and yeah. then you find out because this is where I wanted to get at when we were talking about mother's backstory and you know how she was in love with somebody and then they ended up getting adopted and the boy that she was in love with he always used to sing the song to her and then mm-hmm. they have this program like what you were saying D where it's like you have to be the best of the best and yeah, yep. they recruit you they train you and they impregnate you and that's one thing that i i would like to think about as well like how are they impregnating this these women you know what i'm saying like are they allowing the are they allowing the huh what it was it's just like uh when like a male can't have kids and yeah. they gotta get artificial inseminate that's what it is artificial yeah. inseminate okay. it's okay. they're not having sex dude if this is where you're going with this <laughs> well i was either thinking sex or what is it when um the turkey guys baster. go to the yeah the turkey baster that's what i thought that they were yeah. doing okay so um but yeah i mean to answer your question d i do think that sister crona has a child out there and i do believe that that child is gonna get revenge somehow if uh, that's going to happen or if the child is possible to get revenge. Okay. Trav, what do you think? Bro, first off, Sister Crone thro- threw me through a loop. When she played tag, yes. she, mm-hmm. she was marketed. Yo. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I want to I mention hey. <laughs> real quick, um, I love the, uh, the way they compare the speed and strength of an adult to them being just children. I think that it adds a very uh, nice dynamic to the show. Like, it's almost creepy, but it's how it would actually be if they were being chased. It was. And overpowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it kind of gives you the feel that they've been playing this for 20 years. You know what I mean? Versus just just some Mm -hmm. random adult playing tag. Like, Mm -hmm. she knows how to play tag. You know what I mean? Yep. So, um, and that was another scene, you know, over the rock. When she came over the rock and was looking uh-huh. at her. They always do. Um, and you know, me and D are both super into horror. But the the film score to Insidious by Joseph Bashara. Mm-hmm. He does a lot of like creepy noises where they come in and swoop and they pan. They yeah. did mm-hmm. that they did that so well in this score, dude, with those moments where like the music would build up and just stop real quick. And yep. it would catch you off guard, bro. Yeah, like, I agree. Like you were Trav. saying, she looked creepy. Her mm-hmm. and you know, <laughs> Isabella. Yeah. Well, see, well, see, that's the thing, man. In the anime, while she does look creepy, in the manga, it's like she looked, she looked creepy as hell. Right. Like, yeah. it's, it's like I'm saying, like, I, I want to see that picture. I'll send it to you, but it's just like if you see what she looks like in the manga, like it, like it, it could offend some people. You know what I'm saying? And like that's the reason why. I was saying early on where it's like when we first saw these images, we was just like, why is she drawn okay, like so that? like a podcraft mm-hmm. country, what do they call the little girl? Yeah. Um Bob Biggity Bobbity. Bop- right, Something yeah. But like it, that. It played tribute to a real thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so that's what you mean by offensive, where it's yeah. like Okay. But they, that some people, they was just like, it's not that bad. Which I mean, I everybody has their opinions, but it's right, just right, like right. either either you're gonna read it or you're gonna watch it. But like I said, I feel like that the anime did a, a better job at animating her and making her less offensive, how, like how she was drawn in the in the manga. And I mean, I mean that happens sometimes. You know right, what I'm right, saying? Right. I mean, people people still complain about characters from Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, and it's just like you got to understand. Those were the '80s, you know what I'm saying? It's just like I it was it's, the Mr. Popo stuff, though. You but know Mr. Popo's not Mr. Popo's not black. We've I already did. we've I already did. confirmed that. But I, I I will say that you know that they took a, a huge leap because now in Dragon Ball Super, uh, you have black characters that right, don't right. look like how they looked in the original series. <laughs> so um, nobody yeah. does it better than Naruto, though. Hey, oh. I don't know, man. Tozen from Bleach was pretty. He's pretty well drawn. Yeah. Yeah. His ending was whack, but he was a good character. <laughs> just he like, looked just good. like Bleach in general. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they just can't made seem some to somehow wrap decisions. it up. 
real well, good. So, oh Seymour, Seymour from uh, Tiger and Bunny, like he was drawn yeah, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, oh, good I mean, and Fire Force, is really yeah. cool. Okay, yeah, so, since we're on, since we stopped here, guys. Okay, with the drawing, what do you think about uh, Homeboy zero zero seven or eight from uh, zero zero nine back in the day? What did you think of his drawing? And that was pretty old. Down originally because we had brought this uh, we discussed this in uh roshi's island like way oh, yeah, back yeah, yeah. i remember that where mm -hmm. it's like uh cyborg Z not i, I believe Is it was it eight i think it's six either six okay. or seven a I, I man i can't okay. remember but originally how he was drawn he was drawn like uh african caricature back from the 50s or 60s mm. and as time moved on, they they drew him better. Like he looks nothing like how he looked in the original Cyborg 009 uh anime or manga, which is okay. it's cool. Uh, Trevor, are you okay. looking it up right now? Yeah, how'd you know? Because <laughs> I just I just saw, but is it cyborg is it is it cyborg 007? I didn't Eight. get that far. Jesus Eight. Christ. <laughs> uh, Thanks. I appreciate you. <laughs> oh Lord. Yeah. Cypress Series or Eight is the uh, African American. Well, okay, so I was right. And yeah, I think modern interpretations—they've really improved his design and moved away from uh, the problematic stereotypes that informed okay. it before. Yeah, because he kind of looked like Cisco. So well, yeah. we've talked about this even in American cartoons. All black kids look the same in the nineties. They either had the high top fade, oh, top or they fade. had, they had yeah. the little dreads, mm -hmm. and that was yeah. it. Those were the two you were getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yep. Thank God for progression. Because, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> so, I mean, like, that was, remember, that was one of the things that we had talked about with Bo was right, about, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, representation in anime okay. and how characters, they started to actually, like, look like us and not like these caricatures of, you know, right. things that black people don't look like. Like, nobody here's, black look like that, you know? Here's so. the thing you know, it's an issue <laughs> when black people have to adopt characters as being black. The Piccolo, the Skeeter from Doug, yeah. um, even mm -hmm. Jet Black from uh, Cowboy. From Cowboy, like you know, he's not black, but he's honorary black. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so it's like it's bad when you have to adapt characters as being black, but they're not really because you mm -hmm. got. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I forgot. I forgot what we was talking I about. Forgot where you were. <laughs> Sister Crona, we were on Sister so Crona. Yeah, Sister and, Crona, and I. Yeah, I, 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 I Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I, I would. I'm glad I, somebody's paying attention. <laughs> I, I agree. I do think I appreciate that they toned down Cronus' design from the manga and the anime. They kind of uh, softened up on some of the features that were kind of exaggerated to kind of a problematic degree in the manga. On the flip, though, I feel like they changed her characterization in a way that I wasn't super on board with. In the manga, Sister Krona is presented more calculating and cunning. She has more internal monologues where she's thinking over the situation she's in and how other characters are reacting. In the anime, they got rid of characters' internal monologues, so instead they have Sister Krona just talking about everything that's on her mind and the all doll. her schemes. Yeah, and they added the doll. The doll is not in the manga. Okay. So they gave her this doll to talk to, and the effect of that is that it presents Krona as kind of more off-kilter, that she is kind of a little unstable and maybe a bit insane in a way that I think betrays that fact that she's actually very intelligent, much like Isabella. She has had to really fight her way to survive in this system, and she is also trying to outwit and outmaneuver everyone else in the situation to survive, and she's very in control of herself in a way that I feel like the anime betrays. And I think that also extends to her death scene. In the manga, she kind of goes out with dignity and acceptance. Whereas in the anime, you see her like running around screaming, being chased by the demons. That's not in the manga. In the manga, we have like a very yeah. poetic, beautiful panel of like her smiling, like knowing what's going to happen, because kind of accepting what her life is and like wishing the best for the kids to, you know, fight on in her stead. And then, you know, we don't see her being killed. We just see her smiling with the demon approaches and that's it. Uh, in the anime, they kind of change that to make her dead 
feel like she struggles one last time and kind of fear wow. and uh, losing control of that situation <laughs> that I felt was kind of at the surface to how she was originally presented. So I think that's probably my biggest complaint about the anime is how they handled her character and adaptation. So now in the manga, how you were saying, like, you know, she had a bunch of, you know, monologues inside of her head that we could see. Um, was she still as crazy when she was having these monologues? And do you think that that was the reason why they added the doll? So that way that it would make her seem a lot more crazier? It's not no, even she wasn't really crazy. Like she in the anime, they add her going through like these over the top gestures, like when she's like talking to the doll or even like confronting the kids. Uh, she doesn't really do that in the manga. She has more composed poses. Sometimes she acts a little theatrical to the kids, but in private, no, she's just like kind of thinking to herself much like the kids or Isabella would when they're mulling over a situation and considering like what their next plan of action is like she she isn't again she's like more uh in control of herself and more like she downplays kind of like uh how much she knows and like her, her personality and stuff like that in the manga see for my thought process you saying that is maybe them going into it is she's doing these theatrics the spinning the weird back matrix stuff that she, she be doing for the kids to make them think mm -hmm. that she's one thing but really she's this and i could see that kind of being the even for i mean we don't know at this point that her and isabella grew up together Oh, they didn't, uh, I think, because Isabella is older than her. But so. they know each other. No, uh, they, no, they don't know each other. It, so, yeah. Rona knows Isabella. Oh, because... okay, I thought Isabella requested her specifically. No, she, she just requested help. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she just requested help, but in, uh, in the foundation of things, Isabella, like, she is a top-ranking mother, and like that's why Krona yeah. was giving her all of that praise when she came because right. she thought that by working with Isabella that that would help her get through the ranks. But it's like they had been playing Krona since the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like when they when she got sent there, it's they like did. I'm assuming I'm assuming that grand grandmother she already knew that you know Krona was unstable and whatnot, and they just had to figure out a way to get rid of her. Okay, yeah. so that leads me to another question since Lum has read the manga. Um, and the anime it's perceived that she was sent there to die. Like this was already this is their way of getting rid of her. And that's how I took it. Um how was that portrayed in the manga? In the manga the sense wasn't that she was sent there with the intent that they want to get rid of her. This was like a long con to justify getting rid of her. But it's just kind of the inevitable result is that Isabella, like, again, she didn't know what kind of person Crone would be when she came here. But once she saw that Crone was kind of actively trying to work against her to figure out a way to usurp her as the mom, that's when she had it in the cards that, okay, if Krona gets out of line and I can't control her, then eventually I will just throw her under the bus and get her killed off. And Isabella and the grandma have a very close relationship. The grandma favors Isabella and she allows her certain perks and privileges. So that is why she's also willing to help her throw Krona under the bus. Yeah. So... Moving along to Isabella, like I was saying earlier, we see her backstory. We see that she had a love interest and he she she already knew what was going to happen when uh, when he got taken. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or did she know or did she not know? I can't remember if she knew or not. Did she know? I, I don't think she knew at that point. OK, so she yeah, she, she found out after she got recruited that um, that this is what happens, that the kids they get eaten and whatnot and like that's why she kept on singing the song and then she ended up having ray um how did how did y'all feel seeing her backstory just like with sister crona starting with you lum um did you feel that it made her a much more interesting and scary figure or did you have sympathy for her because you saw what she 
had to go through and she was sad and she was hurt when she discovered that her lover uh, was eaten. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think she is a very sympathetic, tragic character. I think that's true of Krona too. Really, all the moms and sisters in this system are also trapped and basically enslaved by the system. Like, they're not free. Like, they're stuck in the cycle of having to pull each other down, stab each other in the back in order to survive the longest. Isabella too joined the system and her goal was just i want to live the longest i want to be like a human being that they can't eat and so that's just her struggle she's just struggling to survive she gave up on escaping when she saw the cliff when she was a kid in many ways she's a dark counterpart to emma which is why i think she makes for a great antagonist she had a very similar personality to emma when they were when she was a kid, she was pretty chipper and friendly and upbeat. And then when she saw the cold reality of the world, like that kind of broke her. And yeah. she resigned herself to just living in the system. And her way of resistance, which is implied in this, in, through her interactions with the characters and what she says to them, is that, you know, she, e even though she's going along with this farm system and shipping out these kids, like she's trying to give them as long of a life within the farm system as possible which is why she has raised kids with a lot of intelligence so because they are so intelligent to live to the full 12 years before they're shipped out yep. and so mm -hmm. she's a very complex figure like she does genuinely have compassion and love for these kids that she's raising but she's also given up on there being any freedom for humans outside of the system she's resigned herself to over being trapped in the system and is just trying to live as long a life as she can and yeah like she's a victim in all this too what a breakdown look at that yeah <laughs> crushed it <laughs> nailed it i don't even got anything to add or say or nothing that, that's um, it hey thanks for sliding in the dms <laughs> <That's all> I <laughs> yeah i want to pick up where lama left off on that guys and i feel like uh isabella my prediction for her not reading the manga and stuff is that that she's going to use the actions of the kids once she sees them get free when nobody else could and i think it's going to start to shed some light on her and help her kind of bounce back not necessarily be the hero or anything but i think she has the capacity to be a a tragic hero you know somebody who's doomed but um has some sort of redeeming uh factor towards the end of their story arc and uh, that's what she reminds me of because she was happy for them when they got out. You know, she yeah, tells she Ray to go on lit. That's her son at the end of the day. And I think yeah. it's going to help wake her up in the long run. Yeah, because it's like she could have mm -hmm. easily captured Emma right there. And mm -hmm. she, let, she let Emma go. You know what I'm she saying? She also could have so, went with them, though. That's true, mm -hmm. too. But, but, but you got to think if she would have went with them, then that would have meant that all of the kids at right. the farm, they would have been screwed. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. What I'm yeah. And it's like and she also had the track. She also had like the <laughs> little bomb tracker in her chest. And so if she yep. were to escape, they could just explode yep. that and she'd die. Yeah, yeah, that's a wrap. Yeah, I was I was going to bring up uh, like what Lum had said about how, um, you know, she she allows these kids to live out the right. full lives that they could live. And. That's just one of the things. If she, if mother leaves, if Isabella leaves, then you're gonna get somebody else in there, and they're right. not gonna do that. They're just gonna, you know, yeah, like yeah. they're just gonna do the job, and then that's it. So well, they kind of planted those seeds, right? The first episode, the little girl that gets sent off to get eaten, she's yeah. like, "I may not have been as strong and as smart as everybody else, but I love you guys." So there's like the first clue, mm -hmm. yeah. and also. Isabella takes the drawing of her and the girl down off the wall. Yeah. You know, what she does with that, she probably keeps everybody's drawings in like a mm -hmm. keep safe kind of box. Because mm -hmm. like you said, there's a part of her that loves these kids, but at the end yep. of the day, she can only do what she feels like she, she can do because yeah. she yeah, she's there. Yeah. But this yep. was my question. Yeah. Something that isn't covered yet. I don't know if it ever gets covered, but these higher ups like grandma and all obviously i feel like there's a whole organization of mm -hmm. humans selling other humans right 
Do yeah. you think that's something that you can work up to being? Or is this <clears> like <throat> you're born into it like royalty? Where... I'm sorry, go ahead, Trav. Nah, that, that's it. Like, you just... I, I, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that I think that uh, this is something that you work up to. It's kind of like a job where it's like, okay, like grandma, of course, she's at the top of the of the food chain, right? And so it's, like, I, I, it's like, she was once a kid, then she became a mother. And I feel like that she was, she was, you know, just as good or better than Isabella. And like, that's the reason why she's at the top of the food chain. And then... Isabella, who is considered like, you know, one of the top mothers. I feel like that Isabella could take grandma's spot, but we already know that's not going to happen because the only way that that spot would be available is if grandma dies. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that it's a family thing. I do think that it's a, a trust thing. I think that it's based off of how smart you are and how skilled you are. And it's like they have those kids take those tests for a reason because it's like some of the kids, they do end up making it out and some of the kids don't. That's one of the things that happens with Norman. Now, I know Lum knows, but we don't know. But I think that Norman is still alive. Um, I do think that he's going to come back some way, somehow, because it's like we didn't see him die. You know, with Connie, we saw her body. Mm -hmm. and you know, that that's one thing that they always say in horror movies. <clears throat> Unless you see a body, that person isn't dead. So um, I'm wondering if we're going to see Norman come back. And uh, yeah, Trav, that was just me answering your question. I don't know, if, uh, D, if you wanted to have any rebuttal with that or Lum. Uh, Lum, you got anything on it? Yeah, I with in regards to grandma, I do think that is also a position that much like mom, you work your way up to. The reason I think uh, I think the season already implied this because a grandma was mom back when Isabella was a kid. She was the mom of Gracefield and now she's become grandma. So it's a position you can work your way up to. Um, and I think in general, uh, when we go, when we consider like the farm system and then beyond that, I think Promise Neverland ha is an interesting uh, look and analysis of these kind of oppressive systems and the hierarchies they create that are meant to keep people down, keep them into place, and perpetuate uh, power imbalances and uh, poverty, discrimination, and all these things just to, you know, create this class caste system that creates, like, there's these elites on the top and there's people who are just struggling to survive at the bottom. And I think that's something that the series uh, continues to explore even beyond the grace field but i think grace field is a good like encapsulation of that too especially when we look at the sister mom grandma pipeline and the fact that it's all about putting people against each other to compete to survive live the longest and earn the most privileges and try and live the happiest life well when ultimately no matter how much they work at it no matter how many other people they drag down in order to rise to the top they're still never going to be truly free at the top of this food chain like they're all really competing just to still be oppressed by the people who are really holding the power yep mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's kind of like with um ray for example he thought that he was gonna always be there with mom because he was her spy he thought that he was doing a good job being her servant and then she was just like hey it's time for you to go and he's just like well what do you mean like you know i've been helping you this entire time and it's just like like you said they're all competing against each other they all have their roles and if ray was a girl then it's a possibility that he would uh ended up becoming a mom you know the what i'm saying have because, turned. yeah so mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and we and we see that with Emma, you know, Emma, you know, mom, she tells Emma like, hey, you know, I, li I like you. You're smart. You know, you always get high scores. Uh, you know, I, I see how you play with the kids. And, you know, when y'all out there playing tag and then she's like, I want you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw you playing tag. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I like the dynamic there where it's just like, you know, Emma has this choice to either 
become a mother or help out her her brothers and sisters and emma she made the right choice um by doing that so um d finishing it up with you with the question that trav had what's your uh opinion on that i don't think it's something like um how much are you willing to give up to you know to stay alive i mean basically what it comes down to dog eat dog i mean i think that's the easiest way i could say it like i mean but you gotta think it's a very interesting uh pattern that they have because when they're telling them these things and when they they show them what's going on they're literally 12 years old what, what would you do you know like uh, yeah. hey you want to go out there and get eaten by these demons or you you want to stay here with us and it's it's interesting it's frightening um but it's definitely dog eat dog dude yeah. and it's it's something i can't wait to see more of as far as the grandma standpoint because it's like she's willing to use isabella basically she liked her but it's like if she does too good of a job you're coming for my job isn't that how it works so right. what's you know what is it going to boil down to it's going to get interesting and i think it may come down to isabella even double crossing grandmother at one point you know just I mean, to save the kids, maybe they show her that light she needs to see. She might become their inside man. Yeah, Who knows? Yeah, yeah I, I would like to see that, man. It's, you know, it's just crazy how they had lost hope when uh, Norman, he climbed the wall and then saw that there was no way to right. get across. Mm -hmm. And it's like they had been doing all this training, this preparation and whatnot. And I'm happy that they didn't give up. I'm happy that they were able to find a way to escape. And, uh, you know, now with season two being out and we see the stuff that happens up there, I don't want to go into spoilers for anybody, but um, I'm happy that they made it, you know, and I can't wait to see how this season is going to shape up. Like there's new characters in it and whatnot, and the demons are chasing them. And I just want to see what's going to happen next. So um, unless anybody else has anything else that they want to say, you got one more thing, Trev? I got, I I need one more uh, nugget of wisdom from uh -oh. Love. Go ahead. First season alone, how much of the manga is that? Mm -hmm. Where are we at manga-wise? So this, uh, the first season is approximately one-fifth of the manga. It's 37 chapters. The manga is 181 chapters. Okay. So we got plenty of story to still tell. Yeah. Yes. So the first episode of the second season adapted nine chapters. So it's a little faster pace right. than the first season. So it'll be interesting to see like how much they'll cover in this season and what it'll be a season beyond that. So, yeah, I'm curious to see uh, if the story will follow the same pace or they'll change it up a bit. So let me ask you something, because you said that um, the first episode of season two, it covered nine chapters. Is there way more exploring after they leave, uh, you know, the, the farm or uh, because I mean, like, that's nine chapters. That's pretty fast. And then for everything that they covered in that first episode, that's amazing that they were able to do that and just move it along so quickly. Yeah, I think there's a there's a little more exposition. Uh, just some things just take a little longer. They kept all the essential parts from those chapters, so I don't think any of the it suffered in pacing, but it did move faster than uh, I would have expected. Uh, like the first episode, if it would follow the pacing of the first season, I think it would have been two episodes. Uh, but I think I understand why they wanted to like get all this forest exploring running from demon stuff just done in one episode to get to the ending where they meet the new characters who are very important right. so yeah. okay well lum thank you for joining us on today's episode we're glad to have you up here trav i'm happy you yeah you're yeah, part man. of the family now yeah trav. welcome to the fam lum. <laughs> trav, well, thank I'm you glad. you're yeah, welcome man. trav i'm glad that you slid in the dms and uh, before we let you go, Lum, tell everybody in social media land where they can find you at. Yeah, you can find me at Lum Romiyashita on Twitter. And wherever I'm at, I'm by that name, Animation Love Relation Forums, Anilist, wherever there's Lum Romiyashita, that's where you can find me. And yeah, you can check out the Manga Mavericks podcast again. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Manga underscore Mavericks, and we're on every podcast platform you can think of. Same thing for Lum Squad, Lum underscore Squad. That's also on every podcast platform you can think of. And uh, if you like, you know, I 
my uh, profession, my trade is as an artist. I'm an illustrator, animator who I've worked, done work for University of Minnesota and uh, Trey Art Diction Foundation, various clients uh, here in Minnesota. And if you want to check out my art, you can check out my Instagram at Nice. Hell nice. yeah! Thank you for joining us. And uh, with, yeah. with that being said, you can find. Well, I was about to do me first, but I'll save me for last since it's my birthday. You always start, oh, oh, man. I'll start, I'll, start, I'll start with you, D. Go ahead. Tell them where they can find you at in social man. media land. Rebellious double underscore 23, D23 at Instagram.com. And try. try. And you know, you can uh, find me on Instagram at ZK Audio, or you can come. Uh, Send me an ad on PSN at T R A V I O S Z K. <clears throat> and you can find me, your hero Benjamin Banks, at King Benji underscore Banks on Twitter and Instagram. And you can look me up on Facebook by typing in Benjamin Banks, and I should be the first person to pop up. If not, I need to contact Mr. Zuckerberg. And make sure that you follow all of the Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks social media accounts at Leveling Up Banks. And if you're feeling generous and would love to donate to your boys, we have a Patreon at Leveling Up Banks. Thank you for listening hey, to hold this. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's up? I just want to say something real quick. Are you about to sing happy birthday to me? Happy birthday, bro. You ruined it. Hey. Uh, happy birthday. Hey. I ruined, ruined the surprise. <laughs> I always yeah. ruin surprises. Teasing. You got Damn it, you, bro. Scuba Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, hey, thank you, Trav. I appreciate that. I appreciate you and Lum saying happy birthday to me. D. Uh, he said it. Yeah, yeah. I said but it. he did, but he didn't have a smile with it. He was just like, oh, "Happy birthday!" He always got a smile. Well, come on, man. God, it's, it's it's like your birthday only come around once a year. Like, gee, I know, but Look, you talk but about dude. it for six months of the year. <laughs> yeah, two of the two of the greatest voice actors wish him a happy birthday, and you thought that would be enough, Trap. It's yeah, it, here. I've noticed it's never enough. He gets people <laughs> buy a video game for his birthday and Christmas. It's never enough. Hey, we <laughs> need to do. Uh, it's, it's just like uh, that MTV show, My Super Sweet Sixteen. <laughs> oh <Yeah>. God. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I did. So again, everybody, thank you for watching this episode. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that way that you can keep up with your boys. And we'll see you next time. Until then, pinkies up. Hey, hit the double pinky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed this video. And get notified every time we upload a new one by subscribing and ticking the bell icon. You can also listen to the full episode by searching for Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks on your favorite podcast app. If you'd like to help support more great content like this, be sure to check us out on Patreon. We'll have the link posted in the description below. Thanks for listening and see you on the next episode of Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks.